This video lecture is an introduction to the four stages of cellular respiration. Our learning objective today is to build some foundational knowledge. And we're going to start by listing the four stages of cellular respiration. This is very important. And as we add to our foundational knowledge, you want to know where they occur and what are their products. So as you work through this, take notes. List those four stages. What's going in? What's coming out? Where do they occur? And then after this presentation, turn off the video and see if you can do it from memory. That way you go from passive learning to more active learning. Now we know that cellular respiration is really important because that's how eukaryotes obtain energy from their environment. And importantly, all life has to transfer energy to this molecule right here. This is ATP, the energy currency of life. It's unfortunate that you and I and every animal, well, almost every animal, and a lot of eukaryotes, we can't simply sit in the sun and extract the energy from that and put it in a usable form. But of course, plants are capable of using sunlight and storing that energy as a carbohydrate. But even plants still must do cellular respiration. As they make carbohydrates, guess what? They also break them down in cellular respiration to make ATP. So here is how cellular respiration is able to take energy from the environment and convert it to ATP. Let's go over the general equation. We take in some type of organic molecule, for example, glucose, and we're going to react that with oxygen. That's the oxygen you and I breathe in. And then we're going to break down glucose into carbon dioxide and water. And this is going to release some energy. So cellular respiration. This is an example of a chemical reaction. We are making and breaking bonds. So you take the reactants, which is glucose and oxygen. And we're going to break those bonds and form new chemicals, the products, carbon dioxide and water. Now you should notice one thing. This is an exergonic reaction. How do we know that this reaction is giving off energy? Well, look at the products, carbon dioxide and water. They're small. They're oxidized. They have less potential energy than the reactants. During cellular respiration, as we break down glucose into carbon dioxide and water, most of the energy in glucose is going to be lost as heat to the environment. However, through all the different stages of cellular respiration, some of that energy is going to get transferred to make ATP. That's the energy currency of cell. So how do we do this? I just want to take a second and remind you that understanding begins with building foundational knowledge. So start with this. Memorize the equation to cellular respiration. Now, cellular respiration is going to take place in four different stages. So that reaction isn't going to occur all at once. It's going to begin with glycolysis. And second, pyruvate oxidation. Then the Krebs cycle then oxidative phosphorylation is the fourth and final stage. Now, if you go to other websites, other textbooks, you may only see three stages of cellular respiration. And the reason why is because pyruvate oxidation is often lumped in with Krebs cycle or glycolysis. But for my purposes, I'm going to keep them separate. Cellular respiration, it begins with glycolysis. And glycolysis occurs in the cytoplasm so it's not even inside the mitochondria at all. I want to begin with a little bit of a refresher. We're going to take glucose, and this is what a glucose molecule looks like in a simplified diagram. And to further clarify, let's take that one carbon right there, and it's going to look something like this. It's going to be bonded to a couple other carbons, some oxygen, and some hydrogen. So recall that that line, that's a covalent bond. And that ball right there, that's a carbon, and in that molecule, I don't have the hydrogens or the hydroxyl groups drawn on that. So what glycolysis is going to do is we're going to begin to break apart glucose. We're going, to, we're going to break those bonds, and we're going to form some new ones as we begin to oxidize it. Glycolysis is a series of 10 different chemical reactions. And it begins with an energy investment. Recall that ATP, that's our energy currency of the cell, so the cell is going to invest two ATPs to get this reaction started. Now after that, and as we go through our series of chemical reactions, we're going to get some energy payoff. And the energy payoff is we're going to get a couple of ATPs. 
net. We put in two, we get out four, so we got four gross ATPs, but we really just net two of them. Secondly, as we oxidize glucose, we have to reduce something else. So we get this molecule called NADH, and these are our electron carriers. So NADH is carrying some of the potential energy that was originally stored in the glucose molecule. And of course, ATP is also carrying potential energy from the original glucose molecule as well. And we also get two of these three carbon molecules called pyruvic acid. You also may see it called pyruvate as well, depending on whether or not it's acted as an acid or not. The second stage of cellular respiration is called pyruvate oxidation. Now this occurs inside the mitochondria and only if there is enough oxygen present inside the cell for this to happen. We're not exactly sure how it all works, but somehow the pyruvate that was made inside the cytoplasm will get transferred or transported into the matrix of the mitochondria. Once the pyruvate is moved inside the mitochondria, we're going to oxidize it. And that carboxyl group specifically is going to be oxidized to form carbon dioxide. Now there's two CO2s listed in the products. The reason why is we have two of these pyruvates for each molecule of glucose. Now, pyruvate got oxidized. That means something has to get reduced. So once again, we take our high energy electron carriers and they're getting reduced to NADH and they are also carrying a hydrogen with them. And as we lose that carbon, we form a new molecule called acetaldehyde, which actually binds and forms acetyl coenzyme A. So those twos right there, that's for each molecule of glucose. Now remember, there's no glucose after glycolysis, but we're keeping our balance of all of our products as though we started with one glucose molecule at the beginning of glycolysis. But pyruvate oxidation, no glucose involved, just oxidizing pyruvate to acetyl coenzyme A, forming a couple carbon dioxides, and a couple NADHs are getting reduced. Here's the acetyl-CoA. You can see that there's a, a methyl group and there's a carbonyl group. That S is for sulfur and that coenzyme A, well, that's a very large molecule that will now take those two carbons into the Krebs cycle. Acetyl-coenzyme A looks something like this. It's a very large organic molecule. It doesn't really fit nicely into one of the four macromolecules, but you can see some of them there. On the right, you see the phosphorylated ADP. That's part of a nucleotide. And that pentathenic acid, hey, that's actually vitamin B5. And way out to the left, you'll see the acetyl group with the two carbons remaining from the oxidation of pyruvate. Remember, we started off with glucose. Acetyl-CoA is very important because what it does is it brings those two carbons to the Krebs cycle. This also occurs inside the matrix of the mitochondria. The third stage of cellular respiration is the Krebs cycle, named after Hans Krebs, who discovered it in the 1940s. He actually won a Nobel Prize for his discovery. And it's also commonly known as the citric acid cycle. The general purpose of the Krebs cycle we're going to take those carbons from that acetyl coenzyme A and we're going to oxidize them. And we're going to form carbon dioxide. And we're going to form two carbon dioxides for every acetyl that comes in. Now remember, we're going to actually have two acetyl coming in for each molecule of glucose that we began with way back in glycolysis. So I we'll have a total of four carbon dioxides. And because those carbons are getting oxidized, we're going to reduce something else. And we're going to transfer the energy to our NADHs and another electron carrier called FADH2, and we're also gonna form a couple of ATPs. After the first three stages of glycolysis, pyruvate oxidation, and the Krebs cycle, we have now successfully oxidized all the carbon in our glucose to carbon dioxide. So we have six CO2s. And as we've oxidized our glucose molecule through these series of 19 chemical reactions, we've transferred some of that energy and the hydrogens to 10 NADHs, two FADH2s, and we've made a grand total of four ATPs. After completing the first three stages of cellular respiration, we've only made four ATPs. The vast majority are made in this fourth and final step, oxidative phosphorylation. And this is where we're gonna use all those NADHs and FADH2s to make between 28 and 32, or even maybe a little bit more ATPs than that. 
Oxidative phosphorylation occurs on the inner membrane of the mitochondria. and has two components. The first one is the electron transport chain, and the second one is chemiosmosis. Here's a very brief explanation for how oxidative phosphorylation works. I've got another video explaining this in much more detail. But basically, the electron transport chain oxidizes NADH and FADH2, and it uses those high energy electrons to do active transport. What it's going to do is pump protons into the intermembrane space. And by doing so, it stores potential energy as an electrochemical gradient. As more protons are pumped into the intermembrane space, they're building this electrochemical gradient. They're storing lots of potential energy. Now we can use that energy to do work. Now recall that protons are charged particles. They can't pass through a membrane very easily. So there's another large molecule called ATP synthase. And what ATP synthase does is allow these protons to flow down their concentration gradient. So this is facilitated transport. But the ATP synthase uses their flow to do work and basically as the protons push through the ATP synthase, hence the word chemiosmosis, meaning to push, they harness that pushing to make ATP by phosphorylating ADP. Oxidative phosphorylation is really important for our cells because it has a very high energy payoff. For each molecule of glucose, we get 25 to 26 ATPs. And that is a lot more than the four we got from glycolysis and the Krebs cycle. By now, you may have realized I haven't talked about oxygen or the formation of water. Well, it turns out that oxygen is a final electron acceptor. It removes electrons from complex four and it's got these unpaired electrons. So it immediately forms bonds with the protons floating around in the matrix, forming water. Having oxygen present is very important because as it removes the electrons from the electron transport chain, it allows the electrons to continually flow through it and it allows it to continually pump protons into the intermembrane space, which allows you to continually maintain an electrochemical gradient, which allows you to continually make ATP. In summary, cellular respiration, which is also aerobic respiration because we're using oxygen and eukaryotes. We're going to get up to 29 to 30 ATPs, maybe even as many as 32 ATPs by using oxygen. This is the most efficient way in nature to extract energy from organic molecules. And that gives us the ATP we need to have larger, more complex cells, to be a multicellular organism, and to help out with our active lifestyles.